solution slightly differently. I, I don't now propose to go through the individual grounds of appeal because having reread them, I think they're really covered by the submissions which I've already made. Um, I do, however, want to um, just refer to the cases which I refer to in my yes. skeleton, paragraph 6, um, without necessarily showing more to you. So we're starting with Edwards, are we? I'm sorry, my lady. Oh, sorry, I forgot to take off. Becoming second nature, isn't it? Yes. Uh, are, are, uh, are we starting with Edwards? Edwards. If your lady should ask me, I think, what's the point of, what's the point of looking at these authorities? And, um, well, and you persuaded me that you wanted to, so I'm, <laughs> here I am, ready, well, I, willing to listen, well, and the three you, you said you were going to yes, take us to were well, Edwards, Upton and Geary. I, on, on reflection, I don't, I think, need to ask you to open Edwards. I have uh, quoted from yes. it um, in, my, um, in my skeleton from the... From the um, as you will deal with me... Um, Judgment of Lord Justice Bookham in paragraph 14 of my skeleton. Yes. Um, but, but, but what I want to emphasise in relation to um, Edwards is that there were findings of fact that there were um, foreseeable risks. Mm -hmm. risk could have been addressed at minimal expense I, I've, I've said this in paragraph 14 mm -hmm. and yet the appeal was allowed the point being it doesn't matter how foreseeable the risks are how easy it would be to, for the defendant to avoid those risks. That he was ex hypothesi in breach of duty if there was a duty. Because the basis of the insuperable point is that there is no duty. So I was asked questions from your ladyships before, before the adjournment about whether 
the risk were foreseeable and whether it made a difference. And my answer to that is it doesn't make any difference at all. Let it be assumed that the defendants could have foreseen that um, Mr. James or someone else might want to sit on the window ledge to take the air. That doesn't mean that they owe him any duty because it's an obvious risk. That's the point. And your, your, your ladyship, Lady Justice Peter Davis, put to me this morning when I mentioned the case of Geary, that in that case, the defendants had done something. They'd put up a notice. No, no, they hadn't. That was oh, they hadn't done, no, they hadn't done that because they thought a notice might encourage people to slide down the banisters. But there was in that case a history of people doing just this, of sliding down the banisters, of sustaining serious injury. And there was another case following uh, the case of Geary in which a, a person sliding down the banisters suffered serious injury. They knew of the risk. They could easily have obviated it. They obviated it in five minutes following uh, the accident or this, the, the further accident. But all that was nothing to the point. The reason the claimant lost was that there was no duty owed to her. And so it doesn't matter how negligent the defendants are. And I will show, I will show your lady, your lady actually, won't take Certainly. a moment. It, it's in the supplemental by the way. At, um, Page 311. Decision of this court. It, it, it's another one of these cases in which the claimant wins at first instance, subject to a... Uh, hefty deduction for contributory negligence. Uh, but this is on appeal on the basis of the insuperable point. And what I want to emphasize about th th this um, this is a case of a, of a claimant who engages in um, indoor wall climbing or simulated rock climbing. But the point I want to emphasize is paragraph six, the fact. The deputy judge concludes, in paragraph six of this judgment, there can be absolutely no doubt that in February 2002 there are a number of shortcomings in the procedures adopted at the center which fell below industry good practice. The registration process was inadequate. No steps were taken to ascertain the level of competence of climbers. This should have been done so as to ensure that appropriate steps were taken, possibly by the operation of a buddy system, to ensure the safety not only of the novice climber, but also other users at the centre. There was inadequate floor walking and supervision. Importantly, no proper risk assessments were carried out. I'm also satisfied that if competent risk assessments were carried out, then all the shortcomings which have been highlighted by this case should have been rectified. So there are findings of fact of significant breaches of duty, foreseeable risks, assuming that there is a duty. But the reason that the appeal is allowed is that there is no duty. Now, if you take us to the paragraph, please. I'm sorry, ma'am. The, the paragraph of the ratio there, that you're, where they um, say no duty. Is it sidelined? Paragraph 18. Paragraph 17 recites Tomlinson, Donoghue, Donoghue uh, various other cases. Paragraph 18. It's therefore, in my view, necessary to consider whether the risk in the present case was inherent and obvious. The risk of falling from the wall was plainly obvious. The judge held in effect that the risk that the matting might not in every case protect the climber who fell from serious injury was not obvious but I do not consider this finding is sustainable, not least in the light of Mr. Poppleton's own evidence. Evidence apart, it's to my mind quite obvious that no amount of matting will avoid absolutely the risk of possibly severe injury from an awkward fall, and the possibility of an awkward fall is an obvious and inherent risk of this kind of climbing. 
Um, paragraph 20, there's a quotation in paragraph 19 again from Lord Hoffman, paragraph 20, there being inherent and obvious risks in the activity which Mr. Poppleton was voluntarily undertaking, the law did not, in my view, require the appellants to prevent him from undertaking it, uh, nor to train him or supervise him, supervise him while he did it, or see that others did so. So the, 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 the observations I make in relation to this is one I made already, that the, the, this decision was reached in the face of findings of fact uh, to the effect that there were foreseeable risks, that they could easily have been obviated. If there had been a proper risk assessment, they would have been. And if there was any duty, there were breaches of duty. But the claimant fails because there is no duty. So in, in, in our case, it doesn't matter whether it was foreseeable that someone would sit on the window ledge, whether it would cost nothing to put in window restrictors, whether, assuming there was a duty, there was a breach of duty. The claim fails because there was no duty. If I'd shown your ladyship's theory on Weatherspoon, I'd have drawn attention to the passage where Mr. Justice Coulson said, I invited the parties to, to identify, invited the claimant's counsel to identify any case in which a claimant had succeeded when a, a, an obvious risk and the claimant was unable to do so. And there are, there are no such cases. And the other point I make in relation to Poppleton um, is that it's perfectly apparent from those findings of fact by the first instance judge that the defendants were in breach of section 3 of the health and safety at work. Now I bear in mind the um, stricture uh, of Mr Justice Stanley Burnton that the court should be slow to uh, decide questions of criminal liability in a civil case. But the fact is that in it's quite apparent from the findings of fact that there, was, there were breaches of section 3 of the health and safety at work. And so it is in um, Geary and Weatherspoon, and so it is in Edwards and London Borough of Sutton. Matter can it, or it cannot be decisive, can it, that there's been a conviction? If there's some principle that where you infringe the criminal law, there will be a civil <coughs> remedy, it can't matter that whether or not there is a conviction that would be adventitious. And arbitrary. The last point I want to make is uh, in relation to paragraphs 96 and 97 of the judge of this judgment, Judge Cotter's judgment. Where the judge is, the judge having having um, rehearsed his um, the results of his researches into the um, criminal cases, and um, and the Hampstead Swimming Club case, he said this in paragraph ninety six. It is my view Parliament cannot have intended that by the interaction of sections 2.2 and 2.5 of the 1957 Act, an occupier could fail to take a positive act required by the criminal law, here to reduce the risk created by the window to the lowest level, and yet be found to have taken such care as was in all the circumstances of the case reasonable. The risk may have been obvious, but following a risk assessment, the criminal law required steps to be taken. If such steps had been taken, the accident wouldn't have occurred. In my judgment, Section 2.5 cannot be used to negate a specific mandatory health and safety requirement upon an occupier to act. Now, with, with due respect, uh, that paragraph is A, illogical, and B, to the extent that it is logical, is plainly wrong.
the, illogical, the Ill illogicality is in the last sentence. Section 2.5 cannot be used to, to negate a specific mandatory health and safety requirement. That supposes, does it not, that the specific mandatory health and safety requirement will be actionable notwithstanding Section 2.5 of the Occupier's Liability Act. So that, that there's some freestanding obligation which is a mandatory health and safety requirement under Section 3 of the Health and Safety of Work Act, um, which um, operates notwithstanding Section 2.5. That would, that would presuppose, or well, that could only be right if the specific mandatory health and safety requirement created a civil cause of action. But the opposite is the case. Section 47 expressly provides that it doesn't. So there is no logic at all in the last sentence. And I go back to the first sentence, where he says, Parliament cannot have intended that by the interaction of sections 2.2 and 2.5 of the 1957 Act, an occupier could fail to take a positive act required by the criminal law. Now, I, I'm, it's not clear in relation to which legislation Parliament, Parliament's intentions are being assessed, but presumably the Occupier's Liability Act. So what he's saying is that par Parliament cannot have intended by Section 2.5 of the Act that an occupier could fail to take a positive act required by the criminal law. But, of course, when the 1957 Act was passed, Section 3 of the Health and Safety Work Act didn't exist. And there was no statutory equivalent to Section 3 of the Health and Safety of Work Act. There were statutory provisions which created causes of action. For example, the Factories Act, Section 14, Duty to Fence Machinery, Section 29, Duty to Provide a Safe Place of Work, and so on. There were specific statutory provisions. But those statutory provisions gave rise to a cause of action for breach of statutory duty. They didn't uh, affect Section 2 of the <coughs> Occupier's Liability Act. So the notion that Parliament, when it enacted the Occupier's Liability Act, didn't intend Section 2.5 to say what it meant is just wrong. And it is, with, with due respect, I would submit, a, a, an extraordinary proposition. Now, in fact, the history and of, of, of section of, of, of the enactment of Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act is usefully um, explained in the case of the criminal case of. Chargo Limited, which is Divider 8 in uh, one, Friday, page 76, we don't have Divider, page 76. Core or supplementary? Of, a, of the core bundle of authority. Is it in dispute that? Section three had no application when Section two five was passed. No, I'm sure. I'm sure that can't be. But so why are we looking at the history of Section well, three? Um, it, 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 it's not. It's perhaps I put it badly. It's not the history of Section three. It's the nature of Section three and its purpose. And it's a House of Lords case. And maybe I could read the holding at page 77. The, the argument for the appellant, the, the appellants were convicted of an offence under Section 3. And the argument was that um, the prosecution should have specified exactly what it was they should have done, what precautions they should have taken, but failed to take. And it wasn't sufficient simply to say that they'd failed to achieve a result. That was the argument. And uh, the appeals to Court of Appeal and to the House of Lords 
dismissed. I could just read the holding at page 77. Sections 2, 1 and 3, 1 of the Health and Safety at Work Act described a result which the employer was required to achieve or pre prevent, and it was for the prosecution to prove that that result had not been achieved or prevented, but it did not have to identify and prove the acts or omissions by which it was alleged there was a breach of statutory duty by the employers, but once the prosecution proved that the results described in sections 2 and 3 had not been achieved or prevented, the onus passed to the defendant to establish on the balance of probabilities that it was not reasonably practicable for the employer to do more than he did to achieve the required objectives of health and safety. Um, and then uh, the principal speech is that of Lord Hope. Is it page 81? Uh, yes, my lady, I'm grateful. That the, 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 the history of this, the statutory provisions. 74 Act was designed to give effect to the recommendations of the report of the Committee on Safety and Health at Work. Um, and uh, <coughs> the recommendation, as one sees between letters C and D, was that the general principles of safety, responsibility, and safe working should be embodied in a statutory declaration which would set all the detailed statutory and other provisions in a clear perspective, and the Act should begin by enunciating the ba basic and overriding responsibilities of employers and employees. Um, and then at page 83, I've, I've highlighted the passage here, the scope of the duties, the, uh, paragraph 17. In both sections, the word ensure is used. The answer is that he is to ensure the health and safety at work of all his employer, employees and that persons not in his employment are not exposed to risk to their health and safety. These duties are expressed in general terms as the heading to this group of sections indicates. They're designed to achieve the purposes described in section 1 A and B. The description in section 2 2 of the matters to which the duty in section 2 1 extends does not detract from the generality of that duty. They describe a result which the employer must achieve or prevent. <coughs> These duties are not, of course, absolute. They're qualified by the word so far as is reasonably practicable. If that result is not achieved, the employer will be in breach of statutory duty unless he can show that it was not reasonably practicable for him to do more than was done to satisfy. And um, That uh, corresponded with the submission which I uh, made to the judge which he recorded that section 3 was in fact, sections 2 and 3, create offences of strict liability subject to a defence of reasonable practicability. Now the proposition that a statutory provision which creates an offence of strict liability in, in general terms to ensure safety must mean that there's a breach of the Occupiers Liability Act if there's a conviction under that section is in my submission completely untenable. The duties are completely different. The duty under section 3 is expressly not enforceable by civil action and section 2.5 expressly says that no duty is owed in respect of in effect, risks willingly accepted. My lady, having read my learned friend's skeleton, it is not entirely clear to me whether he seeks to uphold the judge's decision on um, the basis of the judge's ratio decidendi, namely it's the criminal conviction which uh, must mean that there is civil liability. Um, I, I've made my submissions on that. Um, he makes various submissions on the doctrine of Valent, on, on the principle of Valentine non fit in Uria, that there must be a, an actual agreement by the between the parties that the claimant will not um, uh, will accept all the risks and will not sue the defendant. But those are the cases he cites, Nettleship and Western and so on, are all cases of the other kind of, uh, the other aspect of Valentine, in other words, where the claimant in advance 
is said to accept a risk of future negligence. And one can see that that principle applies there. But it's no, it is no application of the static uh, predict, uh, situation. Um, also, as I said in, in, um, uh, early on in my submissions, he seeks to make a lot of the um, fact that the window had a defect in that it closed. Uh, I have characterized that as an unwanted safety factor uh, rather than a, a material defect. But e even if it is a defect, um, it's not a defect of which the claimant, uh, or the deceased rather, was unaware. And the judge has expressly dealt with this in paragraph 76, which I quote in paragraph one of my skeleton. There was no hidden feature or element. He knew the sash window had to be held up. So the need to hold open the sash window was as obvious as any other aspect of the um, risks inherent in the activity which he chose to undertake. It's also clear from the judge's earlier findings because um, he, he accepted the evidence that they'd already opened the window and they'd already discovered that. Yes, they, they, uh, so they uh, yes, the relation has already read that. I don't know how much. Uh, earlier in the evening, they had both wanted to smoke, and they had opened the window and held it open. So yeah. there had been two of them at that stage. But um, the ladyships, those are my submissions. Yes. No, thank you very much indeed, Miss Parker. Yes, Mr. Weir. Please, your ladyship. My well, lady, I have a sense you'd like me to cut to the chase, and a sense that I'm going to disappoint you and seek to go through in a stepwise fashion the proper approach to the law. You must take it exactly as you wish. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful. Obviously, I'll respond to any questions seeking to get to the point. Uh, for devoidance of that, by way of introductory submissions, the difficulty with getting to the point is that there is an element of uh, uh, saying one thing and then saying another from a learned friend, so far, so far as it makes it very difficult to say this is not an issue. Because on the one breath, we start the entire submission, oral submission today, with the uh, submission that the appellant's case, this was his opening gambit, is the claim could not succeed due to the principle of law that as an occupier owes no duty to safeguard the visitor against known dangers. Full stop. Later, we have the uh, position that the single issue of law is that where the claimant of full age and capacity suffers injury caused by an obvious danger, the risk of which he has knowingly assumed or accepted, dot, dot, dot. Those are not the same thing. And so I have in some difficulty saying it's this simple, we can go to section 2.5, we can have a look at section 2.5, assess whether the judge either did or should have made a finding of Valentine known known fit injuria, which is the nugget of the case. But to get to that point, my lady, I have to, I have to go through um, various steps and stages. It will be fairly clear, and my lady Fred, um, you see how he puts it, from our skeleton argument, that we do not sit full square behind the judge no. uh, as regards the judge's analysis of the true effect of the criminal conviction and basis of plea. I do say the criminal conviction and basis of plea are not just issues of weight. They are issues that go to determining brackets with other findings of fact that there is a breach of duty causing injury to the claimant, breach of duty under the occupier's Sorry, life. Mr. Weir, you're going to have to slow this. I do apologise, yeah, lady. It's my, it's, it's my endeavour to get to, to, to cut no, to no, no, just early when I understand that, that you're so keen to, to understand what our, our real position is. So I will develop this more slowly. Well, can you just repeat what you Yes, of course, sentence. my lady. The fact, the, of, go to determining. the fact of conviction and basis of plea go to establish A that the Occupier's Liability Act 1957 is what I describe as engaged, and B, that there is a breach under section 2 brackets 2 of the Occupier's Liability Act. In order to establish that's a breach vis-a-vis -vis the deceased, 
I need to take the court to other <coughs> factual findings, but that we recognise that that is not a bar to the court subsequently, and it's critical that this assessment is subsequent, for reasons I will seek to enlarge, subsequently makes an assessment that in reliance on section 2 brackets 5 of the OLA, nevertheless, there is no duty in this case. That is because section 2.5 proceeds by way of defence. And because it is necessary to understand precisely the nature of the breach, see the observations of my lady, lady justice, uh, Nicola Davies, vis-a-vis -vis precisely what is the risk involved in this case, in order to understand whether the deceased voluntarily waived his legal right to sue the occupier for such breach. You can't answer that question until you've gone ahead and identified the breach. So, so in other words, you start with 2-2, two, two. And then, if you're satisfied 2-2 two, two is made out, then go to 2-5 to look at the issue of whether there's that, a difference. That is why it's, you start with section 1. Well, you start, of course, you To start see if you can get one. into section 2. You go to 2-2, two, two, at which point, and I'll take the court through this if I may, you have regard to 2-3 and 2-4. And, and then you get yourself to 2-5. Mm -hmm. The case law concerning the issue of whether or not a person who undertakes an activity with obvious danger cannot rely upon the Occupiers Liability Act. See Tomlinson, see Poppleton, see Geary is not to the point once this court has recognised that both by way of what I might describe as ordinary findings of fact and the fact of the criminal conviction, it is necessary for the court to recognise that the OLA is engaged, by which I mean that there is a danger due to the state of the premises under section 1, so that the court is required to consider whether there has been a breach under section 2.2. Two. My lady, if it assists the court, subject obviously to detours by way of um, responses to only proper questioning, uh, the intention is to make uh, submissions under the following heads. The first head is the steps to establishing liability, and I'm going to call it the OLA or 1957 Act, but I will refer to the 1984 Act in a moment. Two, how there was a, open inverted commas, danger due to the state of the premises. Three, how there was a breach of duty to the deceased. Four, how that breach of duty was a cause of the de deceased's fall, and so the claim was made out. And finally, five, how the judge either did not make any finding, alternatively should not have made any finding, that the deceased would not have been owed a duty uh, under the OLA by reason of section 2 brackets 5 and the operation of the maxim lenti <coughs> non fit injuria. Lady, that's how I to uh, make my submissions. May I start with the 
steps to establishing liability under OLA and start with the Act itself and just invite the Court back to the core bundle of authorities. And I'm probably going to end up repeatedly saying tab without remembering, but it's pages one to three. And section one one on page one, core bundle page one. Provides, as the court can see, the rules enacted by the next two, two next following sections should have effect in place of the rules of the common law. And I'll return to that later, if I may. Uh, to regulate the duty which an occupier of premises owes to his visitors, and then these are the parts to be to be underlined, whether in fact or as of the court. But in respect of dangers due to the state of the premises, and it's, it continues, or to things done or omitted to be done on them, for which we have some guidance in Tomlinson as to what that means, but the only guidance is along the lines of on a lake that would include using a motorboat and so on, but it's not really what this case is about. So for, for these purposes, it's, it's a duty which replaces the common law. It's a statutory duty owed by occupied visitors in respect of dangers due to the state of the premises. If that is at the position... Then we move to section two, which is on page three. And section two, one, sets out that the occupier owes the common duty of care to all his visitors and then seeks to define it at two, two. And at this point, can I deter, given the importance of the Tomlinson judgment, to Tomlinson, please, uh, which is in the same core bundle tab box, sorry, starting at page 94. The OLA 1984 is set out at pages 122 and 123, and that is the Occupier's Liability Act in respect of the Occupier's duty to trespassers. Leadership will see at paragraph 8. Mr. Tomlinson's advisers decided to concede he was indeed a trespasser when he went into the water. And then if you go ahead to page 124, paragraph 13, I should, should have added, I'm in the judgment of Lord Hoffman. It's, it's all common ground that Lord Hoffman's judgment is the judgment of the court for these purposes. Uh, everyone agreed with Lord Hoffman's judgment. But no one else that I can see a group with Lord Hutton's. And um, paragraph 13, Lord Hoffman indicates at B that that concession was rightly made. The duty under the 1984 Act was intended to be a lesser duty, etc. So this is a case which was decided in relation only to the Trespassers Act, as it's sometimes known, the OLA 1984. The OLA 1984, as one might expect, is materially different. If you go back finally to page 122, para 8. Set there, it's there set out as section 11. Section 11 uses the same description as you see at H, by reason of any danger due to the state of the premises. So that that's the same test for what I might call Step one engagement under the 1984 Act, full engagement under the 1957 Act. It's step one only, because you'll see from para nine of Lord Hoffman's judgment, which goes over the page, that section one bracket three provides an occupier of the premises owes a duty to another in respect of any risk referred to in subsection one above, that's the danger due to state of premises, if, to which I'd add if but only if, those three conditions are met. And only if those three conditions are met, do you move on to section one brackets four, which is the, the nature and scope of the actual duty then owed. And section one brackets three C at B provides the risk is one against which in all the circumstances of the case, he may reasonably be expected to offer the other some protection. So unless that's the case, you don't get to the duty under the 1984 Act. And that is why, if the court uh, later is minded to um, go back to the 
heading free will at paragraph 44 and the section under that. That's why uh, Lord Hoffman ends his analysis, and this is page 134 in a passage underlined by my learned friend, paragraph 50. Sorry about the skipping, but if you don't mind the skipping, page 134, para 50, um, latter part of that paragraph, if that's the case, then plainly there can be no duty under the 1984 Act. The risk is not one against which he was entitled under section 13C to protection. So it just never got there. That's on a, that was on the obiter if which is denied type basis. But even then, the analysis had regard to the framework established under the 1984 Act. Lord Hoffman uh, gave his guidance as to the uh, difference uh, between the effect of the 57 Act and the 84 Act at paragraph 38, which is at page 131, under a heading the 57 Act and 1984 Acts contrasted. And so at the end of that passage, you see he says, of course, in such a case, the results are the same. But Parliament made it clear that in the case of a lawful visitor, one starts from the assumption that there is a duty, whereas in the case of a trespasser, one starts from the assumption that there is none. With the greatest respect, that is incomplete as a statement in relation to the contrast between, between the two acts. One doesn't start from the position that there's an assumption that there's a duty. And the 1957 Act, if there is a danger due to the state of the premises, a duty is owed under Section 2.2. You come to the defence later. There's no assumption. That's the position. Whereas under the 1984 Act, you have three additional hurdles to cross, including the court making an assessment that the, the occupier is obliged to for, provide any form of protection. So, under the 57 Act, you were saying if there is a danger due to the state of the premises, the duty is owed. It is, my lady. As always, we come to Section 2.5. I'm never going to ignore Section 2.5, but it comes later logically. It also begs the question, which arises in some of the case law, as to whether, in fact, steps should be taken under Section 2.2. Always. After all, a finding that there is a danger due to the state of the premises is a finding that the premises is unsafe. One is the antonym of the other. And it would not be so surprising in those circumstances if the occupier was expected to offer some protection. Indeed, otherwise, the paradoxical position will be reached where an occupier who does owe a trespasser a duty does so see section 1 brackets 3c on the basis that the risk is one against which he may reasonably be expected to offer the other some protection, but no such assumption can be made to the lawful visitor. Occupiers Liability Act, Section 2. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, as Lord Hoffman set out uh, in the Tomlinson judgment, that the court will, I would add, in the ordinary way, conduct a balancing exercise when considering whether or not there has been a breach of duty. This is, uh, this is a statutory uh, claim, not a common law claim called the common duty of care, but it shares obvious similarities with the ordinary approach in negligence, where you consider the 
nature of the risk, the extent of the risk, and the consequences of the risk materializing on one side of the balance, and on the other side of the balance, firstly, the cost of taking preventative measures, and secondly, and this is the uh, emphasis of Tomlinson, the social value of um, permitting that danger to exist. And that is all set out in para 34 uh, of the Thomson Judgment, page 130. So page 130, para 34. And, and there, Lord Hoffman, this is obviously inevitably over to, but says even in the case of the duty owed to a lawful visitor under section 2.2, question of what amounts to such care as in all the circumstances is reasonable depends upon assessing, etc. <laughs> and then returning, if I may, to the actual wording of the Occupier's Liability Act, so this is page 3. Section 2, brackets 3a, correctly identified as relevant by the learned judge below. The circumstances relevant for the present purpose include a degree of care, and then I would emphasize, and of want of care, which would ordinarily be looked for in such a visitor, etc. That's important because very quickly, one slips into the position of carelessness by the visitor equals no claim. Very quickly that the thrust of submission can translate into that. And it's the other way round. The occupier should anticipate some want of care. And I will, um, pursuant to the injunction from Lady, Lady Justice uh, Nicola Davies, condescend to the facts, of course, but, but in a moment, if I may. When, when, when going through the stages, the facts of this case in relation to that issue. But just for the moment, at a higher level of generality, to identifying that the sort, giving a sense of what the occupier's duty encompasses. It encompasses recognizing that your visitors are not always careful. Exactly, there's, there's case law from a long time ago in relation to employers' duties to employees to similar effect. London bus case 1948 and the House of Lords all setting this out. It's, it's, it's very ordinary position uh, to anticipate. Also, uh, section 2 brackets 4. Section 2 brackets 4 provides, in determining whether the occupier of a premises has discharged a common duty of care to a visitor, regard is to be had to all the circumstances, so that, for example, A, where damage is caused to a visitor by a danger of which he had been warned by the occupier, the warning is not to be treated without more as absolving the occupier from liability, unless in all the circumstances it was enough to enable the visitor to be reasonably safe. The significance of that provision is made clear by Lord Denning in the case of Nettleship and Weston. I'm going to ask the court now to, I'm afraid, leave this bundle go to the supplementary bundle of authorities. It's page 373. This is the learner driver case, and a learner driver st still owes the ordinary standard of care. in this case, to her driving instructor. That was what Nettleship and Weston holds. And the uh, defence of Valenti will not wash in that case. And I'll come back to Valenti in its full force. The defence of Valenti will not wash simply on the basis that the driving instructor, of course, knows that his driver is inexperienced because he's giving her a lesson. And if the court can kindly go to B at the top, 
or Dunning says, I would add only add this, if the knowledge of the passenger were held to take away the duty of care, it would mean that we would once again be applying the maxim, sienti known fit injuria, knowing. That maxim was decisively rejected by the House of Lords in cases between employer and workman, C. Smith and Baker. And Smith and Baker was a, a, a case in which Lord Porter had said that an inviter's duty to an invitee is to provide reasonably safe premises or else show the invitee accepted the risk with full knowledge of the danger involved. Sorry, that's, that's London Graving, it's my fault. Uh, Smith, Smith Baker was, was where the uh, House of Lords uh, said the question in each case must be not simply whether the plaintiff knew of the risk, but whether the circumstances are such as necessary to lead to the conclusion that the whole risk was voluntarily incurred by the plaintiff. So that was rejecting the Sienti approach. Whereas carrying on, and by Parliament, in cases between occupier and visitor, see section two brackets four of the OLA, overruling Horton's case. And it's in Horton's case that Lord Porter had adopted the um, approach. It was in a work setting, but it was not an employer-employee. And a welder knew that the state of play was dangerous at work, and he carried on working. And he had no claim, because he knew. And Lord Denning makes clear that's what Section 4 was taking out. It's that the purpose of a duty to warn is to impart information to the claimant. So if the claimant has that information already, he knows, then it has been said there's no duty to warn because you're telling him something he already knows. But section 2.4 is saying, don't think that even warning him is necessarily going to be enough. And that's of a piece also, as I'll come to with section 2.5. So that's Lord Denning saying, and he said it in another case as well, uh, called Rolls and Nathan back in 1963, that the Parliament was clearing up the unsatisfactory state of the law as it had been left by Horton's case. That's why we're nowhere near the world of, is it an obvious danger? Because obvious danger is knowing it's a danger. Sienti, known fit injuria. Once we're in the OLA, so full knowledge does not suffice to produce a defence. And finally, we have section 2, brackets 5. Now that's uh, common ground between the parties today, but given the importance of any judgment this court's going to give, the court can see from our scanners and argument that one was referenced, the judgment of Mr Justice Coulson and Geary. Two, as it happens, um, there's uh, Lord Denning confirming this in a case called White and Blackmore, 1972. Uh, 2QB651 at 662, that this is Parliament preserving the doctrine of Valentine known fit in Europe. So there is no doubt that that's what Parliament's intention was. We have Court of Appeal authority as well as the judgment of Justice Coulson, the suggestion to that effect in Clark and Insel in reference in. in Mr. Justice Dawson's judgment and CR skeleton argument. There's no doubt that that is the position, and that is consistent with section 2, brackets 4, which is saying sienti known fit in jury is not the position. The position is valenti known fit in jury. And looking back at section 2, brackets 5, and the wording that uh, Parliament has chosen to employ, So this is page three of the core bundle of authorities. The common duty of care does not impose on an occupier any obligation to the visitor in respect of risks willingly accepted as his by the visitor. And then explaining that this is to be approached on the Valenti basis in brackets. So the common duty of care exists. It's not saying there is no common duty of care. It's saying it won't be a breach of the common duty of care. In other words, we're full square within section two still. We have a defence. Mm. 
Mr. Weir, forgive me for stating what you may regard as simplistically obvious. Yes, ma'am. But in order to get to 2.5, one literally has to work one's way through from section one onwards. Absolutely, ma'am. If you don't work your way through, as, as, as I outlined earlier, you won't be able to work out whether Valenti bites. So not only does it does it fit with how one would expect to read a statute, just as we saw section 1, 1, 1, 1, 3 and 1, 4 of the OLA 1984 proceeded in a stepwise and logical fashion, that this has been drafted in a stepwise and logical fashion and also for good reason. Because you would not otherwise be able to make that assessment. You, you would be doing it in the ether. Uh, but but the, even the language emphasises that you're in section two. After all, there's no suggestion here by this stage we haven't got a danger due to the state of premises, and the danger due to the state of premises imposes the occupier's at, um, common duty of care. That's what it does, section two one. So, my ladies, that's. That's how, in our respectful submission, the, the Act functions. And it is very much this Act, we'll come back to our friend Tomlinson in due course, but to, to contrast the position with how things work under this Act. Well, that was, if I may say so, my concern during earlier submissions. That it was on this Act that this claim was brought. One cannot forget the terms of the Act. We'll come to the facts, but the Act is the basis. My lady, it's, it's essential in our submission. It's essential, and it's led to some of the difficulties, because there are no doubt there are some difficulties with some of the analyses. And obviously, I um, proceed with caution because I don't wish to take take on more than I need to. I don't wish to throw criticism around in relation to senior judges and and their assessments any more than is necessary, strictly necessary. But I do respectfully see this case is the opportunity to set the record straight so far as concerns the proper application of the OLA. Well, ladies, can I then move to my uh, second heading, which is how there was a danger due to the state of the premises. Ladies, for this I go to Lewis and Six Continents PLC, as author which I'll go to in a moment, as authority uh, for the proposition <coughs> that whether there was a danger involves consideration of whether there was a reasonably foreseeable risk of falling out of the window due to the state of the premises. That case also involved a fall from a window, albeit a window was at almost normal height. It was five centimetres below normal height. There are building regulations that tell us it should be 800 mil <coughs> above the ground, and I'll come to that later. So, my ladies, if you kindly go to the principal authorities bundle, uh, and uh, actually I didn't put the page number because I was going to take you to the tab, but just give me one second and I'll have the page number in a moment. Uh, page 154. So I'm now in the judgment of Lord Justice Ward in a case in which the Court of Appeal held that there was no danger due to the state of the premises in a hotel room with a near normal height window. Paragraph 15 in the middle, I'm picking up sentence that starts, but failure to carry out a risk assessment helps not a bit to establish the key requirement, namely that the risk of falling out of the window was reasonably foreseeable at the time and not after the event. And if you also kindly go to para, para 21 and para 22, you will see para 21 latter part. This window did not present any obvious danger to an adult. Para 22, no such accident ever occurred previously. It was, in my judgment, in those circumstances, not reasonably foreseeable that an adult would so lean out of the window to get fresh air, etc. Over the page. Uh, you don't
don't get it quite so cleanly in the judgment of Lord Justice Sedley, but you, if, if the court identifies the short paragraphs 24 to 29, you, 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 you get the same essence, but you don't get quite a single sentence that um, provides it with that clarity. Now turning to the judgment, which is in the corner of the bundle, my tab nine, but not yours, but it starts at page 53 as we know. The low height of the window sill is identified in a number of places, including paragraph five on page 54, at 46 centimetres above the ground, as opposed to the normal 800. 80 centimetres or 800 millimetres. Uh, and the uh, risk is identified by the judge at 63B, which is page 69. And this is an important paragraph. Uh, where the judge says, unlike the position in Tomlinson, and I'll come back to that if I may, um, it's possible here to identify the state of the premises which carried the risk of the injury the ability to fully open the lower sash of a window with a low sill, giving rise to a risk of a person falling out of it. Well, Hoffman and Tomlinson refer to water as being perfectly safe for all normal activities, the actions of the claimants in that case being abnormal. Here, the window was not safe for all normal activities. As if opened, which is the very purpose of the sash window, it presented the risk of a fall as it was so low relative to, and there should be two there, relative to the centre of gravity of many adults. That is an essential finding. And uh, is one that perhaps requires of some explanation, and the fact that it requires of some explanation goes to show later in my submissions how, <laughs> how it was not in any way accepted by the deceased. The, the position in relation to centre of gravity is uh, not necessarily immediately obvious. It may be to this court, but this court is in no way normal. Uh, reality, it's a reality. <laughs> it's a reality. Get, get used to it. But uh, the, the, identifying the person, whether they're on the... I, uh, I've been encouraged to say the Glasgow underground, by Lord Hope at one point, it doesn't matter who they are who this notional person is. But the notional person may not be obvious at all at first blush. But if you go to a window which is at a normal height, 800 mil, why are they at that height? Not just because you can be fired out if you trip and fall, but because uh, when you go to the window and open a window, which is a judge recognises a normal activity, and maybe look out or try to get some air, hear someone, see something, have a peek, all the usual things that one can do with open windows, for instance, when it's hot, your body is fully full square inside the room, meaning your centre of gravity is full square with inside the room. And if you can imagine, because you exaggerate to make a point, you, you can take the sill higher and higher. And if you take it right up to neck level, you can only get out your neck. So your 99% of your body weight lies inside the room. And there is no possibility of you firing yourself accidentally out of that window. As you take the window sill down, your centre of gravity has more opportunity to go outside rather than inside the fabric of the building. That is what a low window sill does. That is the risk to which you become exposed with a low window sill. That's readily and clearly identified by the judge. It presents the risk of a fall as it was so low relative to the centre of gravity of many adults. So this this. This is a problem, which, which I've faced in other, another case, which I've got at the moment, in, in relation to someone firing off out of a window because of the respective height of the window sill to the ground. So that's the risk that's been created by the lowness of the window sill, and that is why 
the building regs and date the, for a modern building that it's 800 mil. And that's been, that's been so identified. So it's, it's not just it's low and therefore we don't like it. It's low and it presents this particular problem or hazard, hazard to a visitor. So does the risk vary depending on the size of the opening when the lower sash is fully open? Well, lady, uh, I wish to uh, step aside from answering that question simply because I wish to stay full square within the judgment as much as I possibly can. Right. Uh, and I'm cognizant of the observations of the court in relation to the danger of speculation. This is not a retrial. This is not an opportunity for me to make submissions as to how the accident happened. This is an opportunity for me to reflect upon what the judge found and take issue as is clear with insofar as para 76 is said to mean one thing. I take full, full issue with that. But so far as concerns the accident, what we know is that this is a risk that the judge has identified as amounting to a danger due to the state of the premise. I haven't quite got to sort of following all of this through on the breach, but I'm part way through it. Is identified as a breach for this window with this window that moves up the height of about two feet above that. And that's as far as we need to go, my lady, without sitting here today and worrying about whether a bigger aperture makes it harder or easier. There's, with a smaller aperture, is, he, is a person more likely to step their body round the outside? With a bigger aperture, not? Or the other way around? We don't need to resolve those issues because what we have here is a clear recognition of the nature of the risk that the low window sill presented to all visitors. So forgive me, my lady, for I'm not intending to be difficult, but, um, but by responding in that way. Uh, so we also have the uh, sash mechanism being defective. The learning friend quite properly takes us back to paragraph 76, but I'll, I'll come to paragraph 76 in the fullness of time, if I may. Where I get to before paragraph 76 is first is an identification in paragraph 8 as to the problem, just for the record. Paragraph 8 of the judgment uh, identifies the problem in, right, in the, right in the middle in brackets as the lower sash would close under its own weight. So it's para 8, page 55, about six or seven lines up from the bottom and in brackets. That's the, that's the defect. It's described as a defect um, by the judge. Uh, and, then, and then we have uh, the, uh, that's para 61, I think. Yes, para 61, page 68. And I actually approached the issue of uh, whether that affected the deceased under the heading of causation. But it can be addressed here. But the, the question here is, is there a danger due to the state of the premises where there is a sash mechanism which is defective? Those are the findings of the court. One, it's not difficult to work out how that could, could, could be a problem somebody who is doing a normal activity, namely seeking to make use of the window because they have to hold it. And whilst the judge, perhaps somewhat ungenerously, uh, I might respectfully suggest, um, indicates at paragraph 41 that it's slightly but not very awkward, I think it's not too difficult to see that nevertheless that is a finding, even if slightly, um, that, that it required the deceased to be in an awkward position. And again, one can sit and speculate as to quite how and one, one, the deceased um, position himself, but that is not respectfully the task of the court today. Does, does, does the judge anywhere resolve um, the issue posed by the submission he recalls in paragraph 61? Second sentence of paragraph 61, he recalls the submission that the faulty window mechanism increased the risk of accidents. My, la my lady... Not obviously the way the way that we've approached it via our respondents' notice um, was uh, to suggest that uh, he did or should have recognised that this was uh, relevant. Well, you're going to develop that submission, are you? 
take your time. Are you going to develop that supervision? Well, I, when that comes really with causation. Yeah, okay. Um, but the, I would add what we also put in our respondent's notice, which, you, which, which is page 28 in the core bundle of paragraph 1. So page 28. 1D. Which was that the low height of the sash window, I would add also, made it liable to be sat on uh, by someone seeking to lean out for air and or to smoke, a finding the judge didn't expressly make, but which we would suggest either is implicit in his judgment or, or should have been. He made a finding that the deceased sat on it, and we would say that's of a piece, but that's of course very natural. It's another trouble with the low window sill is that you're going to sit on it. The moment you sit on it, you're moving your centre of gravity further to the outside. You're doing that which you're, you're not going to do with a regular window. Brackets, if you do, see Lewis, <laughs> then you're outside the OLA. You're, you're very much freestyling at that point. But here is a low window sill, and that's actually something of an inducement to sit, which is exactly what the deceased did. Well, lady, I said I'd go back to the first part of paragraph 63b, where the judge said that this distinguishes the position from the uh, case of Tomlinson. Uh, and the court already uh, has had submissions in relation to what is the ratio of Tomlinson. And we maintain our position, uh, which is that it's as set out at paragraph 29 in Lord Hoffman's judgment, and it could not be clearer. Uh, so the effect, and, and I would have added that the head note at page 94 for such an important case is surprisingly short because that is all the case decided. The court has, has the judgment again, page 94 of the principal clarity bundle. Just kindly read the section between G and H it held. So all we've got is one, the OLAs don't apply, neither of them, and two, even if the OLA in nineteen eighty four applied lose under section 13C, which has nothing to do with the court's analysis today. Uh, and, and, and as always happens when the court gives guidance on an area outside the facts of the case and outside the legal parameters of the case, there is a risk that the guidance will be misconstrued, the fault obviously lying with others and not with the person giving the guidance. As opposed to the judges falling into the trap of saying things they don't need to. They don't, they don't need to, my lady. Uh, and and they, then, they are then apt to be taken and applied outside mm -hmm. of their context. Mm -hmm. And we see this here, because it has become a, uh, I won't say, it's not, it's become a, an, an approach uh, which has been able to be um, set out in very short order, we see from Lord Justice McComb when we come to the Edwards case, it's just, just, to simply, just to simply say no duty um, when, uh, no duty to protect or, or even warn when the hazard is obvious. And that, respectfully, simply is not the state of play of the law at all if you're within the OLA. If you are an activity, as opposed to what's sometimes called an occupancy case, then you're full square within Tomlinson. Tomlinson is an activity case. If that helps the court. We sometimes describe them in those ways. You have occupancy duties and you have activity query duties. Sometimes there'll be a duty, sometimes there won't, but that's, that will be, to be determined by the court. Uh, and what Tomlinson is saying is this is not an occupancy duty case. And whilst I'm here, uh, because it flows so easily from that. 
one of the three cases that Malone friend prays so heavily in the area of Pocketon couldn't be clearer uh, that it has nothing to do with this case because it's an activity-based uh, case. And I'll just take you to that. So that's the Supplementary Bundle of Authorities. It starts at page 311. I, I'm rather hoping you at least had the index to the Supplemental and Bain Bundle, which would be a start. Yeah, if we do. I'm grateful. Uh, so, starting at page 311, uh, you were taken to the facts of Poppleton, but can I just take you to what was actually determined? Page 313. Paragraph 7. This was the judge, as in at first instance, rejected Mr. Poppleton's claim insofar as it alleged breach of section 2 of the OLA. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the state of the premises. Paragraph 8. The judge then considered what was the nature and extent of any common law duty of care, owed, etc. And paragraph 9 over the page. The judge held there was a breach of the common law duty of care. Per the Court of Appeal, referencing uh, Tomlinson at paragraph 17, we get, as well, a friend properly took you to, to paragraphs 18 and 19, and, and the conclusion, paragraph 20, there, there, be, there being inherent and obvious risks in the activity which Mr. Poppleton was voluntarily undertaking, the law did not, in my view, require the appellant to prevent him from undertaking it. I'm not going to sweat that whole issue of whether there are Section 3 liabilities even if no convictions but so far as concerns the obligation to have helped Mr Poppleton the negative judgment shows there couldn't have been a section 3 conviction in relation to it there may or may not be convictions in relation to other things going on in that premises I know not but relevantly there couldn't possibly be I'll come back to that but what we see from Poppleton is it's an activity case under the common law for which one can then apply full square the analysis of Lord Hoffman in Tomlinson. But not in an occupancy case, which Tomlinson was not. The uh, next submission I have is that the judge also correctly supported his analysis that there was a danger due to the state of the premises by reference to the criminal conviction. And that's paragraph 63A. And because this may not be an issue, but nevertheless may be because of the difficulty of identifying precisely what is and is not an issue, may I in, in short order just go through um, the underlying basis for this. The 63A is the judge recognising, it's page 68. Sorry, a lot of jumping around. Page six, uh, para 63A, my lady, at page 68 of the judgment. The defendants through the guilty plea accepted there was a reasonably foreseeable risk of harm for terrorist adults falling from the sash window due to its low position. Uh, and then Mr. Walker um, accepted as much, my paraphrasing of the last sentence. And in reading that out orally to the court today, he didn't suggest that he didn't. But that was an inaccurate summary of his position. Nevertheless, just in very short order, may, may, I, may I set out why that, that's the case? Conviction on a charge under Section 33 necessarily involved the court holding that there was, and here it, this goes in inverted commas and then I'll give you the reference for it, a material risk 
the health and safety which any reasonable person would appreciate and take steps to guard against. That, my lady, comes from the judgment of Lord Hope in the Shargo case, paragraph 27, which is in the main authorities bundle, pages 87 to 88. Sorry, which paragraph again, please? It's 27, my lady. 27, thank you. And we've, we've marked it up in, in yellow. Yeah, you have no doubt worked out ours are yellow and theirs are <laughs> there's blue. Glad one of us didn't choose red or it feel like US, <laughs> US, US election or something going on here. Um, so, para, eight, para 27, this is, this is the essence of the assessment of the House of Lords in the Chargo case. The, the question before the court was, do you need to, to go so far as to prove that there was a, a, an injury, and the answer is no, you don't. You don't go all the way to injury. You're dealing with risk of injury, uh, and what needs to be shown, you, you then pick up that I had read out over the page at page 88, the last part next to B. The last sentence. And lest it was not clear that that involves what is foreseeable, we have Court of Appeal guidance from none other than Lord Justice Hughes, who seemed to give every major judgment in a criminal case during his time in the Court of Appeal, bar none, as far as I can work out. Uh, and that's in the supplementary bundle in a, in, in a case called Tangerine Confectionery Limited. Hughes well, didn't hold back in the Supreme Court either. <laughs> so that's supplementary bundle. My lady, it's a supplementary bundle. That's my tab 40. Uh, wrong bundle there. It's 212. Yes, and it's two. Yes, my lady. And, and two one, if you can start at 218, there is no need to consider the facts. Indeed, the facts barely make an appearance until the end in this case. It was a sort of lawyer's outing, again, uh, in relation to what Section 3 of the Health and Safety Work Act requires the prosecution to prove. And I'm just, first we're going to give you the paragraphs, because you, you, you can sort of go through them then. Para 25, 30, 33, and 36. Thank you. So 25 is... Uh, Lord Justice Hughes following on from the paragraph I've just taken the court to in Chargo and then, and then because there are lawyers involved nothing is ever entirely clear and always open to further debate uh, and here the debate was is there a requirement of foreseeability in relation to the first step of there being a risk as opposed to just a second step of not taking reasonably practical steps and the short answer is yes but we get there, you can see that's the question being asked at para 25. And then if the court will say, and skip on the para 30, you'll see there's a reference to Baker and Quantum, and I'll come back to the significance of that later, which is a civil case. Uh, what Baker, that how Baker and Quantum, para 33, first sentence, held by majority <coughs> foreseeability does play a part in assessing risk. And then para 36, we've sidebarred. Uh, and you see the conclusion. Uh, the Just give us a moment, we'll read the Yes, I'm sorry. You actually, probably don't need to read the whole of para 36 at all. You just need the first few sentences. Of it. And 
our submission is that that is materially equivalent to addressing the question under Section 1 of the Occupiers' Liability Act whether there is a danger due to the state of the premises, which I take in the Courts of Lewis case. Uh, and lest there was any doubt about it, uh, certainly it proceeded that the Lear case, as in this case in the criminal court, proceeded on just such footing. See the uh, four bundle of authorities, page 18. This, this, is, this is the same defendant in response to the Section 3 charge, seeking, as my learned friend explained, to contend that there was no case to answer. And see paragraph 12 at the bottom. A heavy criminal court. Indeed. Oh, did, did none other than Brian Levison came out for, for this one. And Sir John Saunders. Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, held, in short, both before the judge and this court, it's been argued that foreseeable risk of injury in this context, namely the criminal context, the lady have this, it's a para 12, Thank you. Uh, is determined by the decision of the Court of Appeal in Lewis. And although my learned friend rightly says the whole outing was not their finest hour, nevertheless, there's nothing wrong with that analysis. Namely, that the test to be applied is materially the same. And that's this defendant making that submission to this court in the criminal division. And that's why the finding of a conviction isn't just an issue of so far as concerns at this point in the, in the analysis, uh, section one. And it's here that the court can be reinforced in making that assessment by A, the approach of the Court of Appeal in the Tangerine Confectionery case, which was, as this court has just seen, to apply across the civil analysis in Baker and Quantum Clothing of the Noise at Work case to the criminal context. And in the Hampstead Heath Winter Swimming Club case, in a passage that I'm going to take the court to in just a moment, two passages, in which Mr Justice Stanley Bernstein, as he then was, uh, also recognised that the Tomlinson approach applied equally to Section 3. And the learned judge below's assessment at this stage of the inquiry was right that the converse applies. You've got a mirroring or, or matching in this particular context, namely the Occupiers' Liability Act, between a criminal charge or conviction in relation to risk of injury due to the state of the premises and whether or not the premises is, has a danger under OLA Section 1. They are materially the same test. And that's not so very, not so odd that that should be the position. Mr. Mr. Justice Stanley Burton should be saying what, what Lord Hoffman says in Tomlinson as to whether the OLA applies at all would also be the approach that the criminal court would be expected to adopt in relation to, therefore, whether or not there's a risk under Section 3 against which they're under duty to take any steps to guard. So the, the passages uh, are in paragraphs 46 and 63. 46, if you kindly go to page 173. Uh, can I invite the court to read the whole of paragraph 46, please?
paragraph 63, which the court will find starting at page 176. I pray and aid the whole of the paragraph, but for these purposes save time, just a first sentence should suffice. It's confirmatory of the approach already taken, but it's crystal clear. And just whilst in this uh, judgment, it was at Paris 51 and 52, and we've sidebarred them. Sorry, yeah. Mr. Moot, can you just allow me to read that? Yes, of course, my lady. of any judgment, my lady. We set out in our skeleton argument, but I'll take you to page 174. It's the analysis of Mr. Justice Stanley Burnson at Paris 51 and 52, which establishes that the Section 3 duty bites also in relation to, you see this in the, in the passage of Section 1, brackets 3, the condition of the premises in the italicised portion end of 51. So, my lady, that's, that's the uh, engagement or application of the LNA. That's an appropriate phrase. And I now turn to my next heading three, which was how there was a breach of duty to the deceased This finding is achieved by a combination of two routes. Uh, one, the basis of plea of the appellant at the Crown Court, and two, the findings of the judge. Can I start with the basis of plea? The court will record, and I've taken you to para 28 in Chargo, the judgment of Lord, Just Lord Hope, in, in which I sought to emphasise orally that the risk uh, was a risk which any reasonable person would appreciate and take steps to guard against. That was the end of para 27, page 88 of the bundle. So it could be said that the conviction, conviction itself, before we get to basis of plea, establishes that A, the appellant, should have taken steps to guard against the risk of visitors falling out of its low-sealed windows. But in any event, we have the basis of plea, which is your ladyship's seen is in the supplementary bundle at page 22. And that included the acceptance, they accept, that the sash windows did present a low risk that someone may injure themselves and that restrictors should have been put in place. The position could not be clearer. Page 22, my lady, of the supplementary bundle. They don't have to turn it up again, but that's, that's where it is. So here is an agreement in the Crown Court on which basis quite an achievement if your ladyship has managed to get through a bit further without first destroying it by any Very other means. Very small cartridges. Uh, Thank you. My lady, uh, here was an agreement before the Crown Court. On which basis the appellant was sentenced? That the appellant should have put restrictors on the windows with low window sills. I, mean, I didn't think I needed to bring this authority to the court, but 
relatively recently, Lord Justice Coulson, in a case called Day against Womble Bond Dickinson, which is a professional negligence case, said at Power 41, but I hope this is, should be acceptable, he said, it is well established that it would be incoherent if the civil law produced a result that was inconsistent with the verdict and punishment imposed by the criminal law. Now, that was a case involving a claimant who had been guilty of a criminal offence, then seeking to sue the lawyers who represented him in the health and safety charge for which he was convicted and given a mighty sentence. Can I have a citation? But I yes, it's called Day against Womble Bond Dickinson, 2020, EWCA Civ 447, at para 41, yep. which engages a case which I imagine is well known to this court called Gray and Thames Trains, which is a sort of judgment to Lord Hoffman, and that's the, if you go off and kill someone and you are convicted of murder, you can't be heard to complain about the consequences of your own unlawful conduct. Uh, but the principle of coherence or consistency is one that we pray and aid. And so, I, again, respectfully, we do not see the basis of plea as merely of <laughs> evidential weight. We see the requirement for coherence between the civil and criminal law lying uh, essentially at the heart of where the judge was trying to get to. I think that was the kernel that lay within <coughs> the judgment. That the judge was, was struggling with the idea that here is a defendant who can attend the Crown Court and say, I accept I needed to put window restrictors in and yet be heard to say something quite different in the civil court. We recognise that Section 2.5 is alive and well and can be employed. So, so he overextended himself, respectfully, in his analysis. But this may have driven him, this, this sense of the need for consistency and coherence, mm -hmm. and in that part he was, he was correct. So that what we have here is uh, subject to linking it in to this visitor, because it's common ground and set out in the judgment below by reference to case law from the Court of Appeal, that the common duty of care is owed to this visitor. But that's, that's the basis of plea, part of the equation, which is more than merely weight. It is, it is an important function for this court to respect the sentencing basis of the Crown Court. Crown courts do not just engage in the process of convicting. Criminal law for, for those convicted does not, regretfully for them, end there. It then proceeds to sentencing, which is a key and core function of the Crown Court. Uh, and it's, that's, that's what uh, Lord Justice Colson, we, we respectfully say, was driving at when he properly said um, would produce a result inconsistent with the verdict and punishment imposed by the criminal court. Well, is it, is it, is the emphasis being on the sentencing basis or the basis upon which the plea was in fact entered? In other words, the acceptance of the responsibility by the defendant who entered the guilty plea. Well, my lady, I, I, I do respectfully entirely see the force of that observation and would be equally happy to, 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 to have the basis of plea put within the part of conviction. but. Strictly speaking, I would be forced to accept that Shargo says uh, that part of the conviction is the duty to take steps to guard against. The only friend picked up on that and said, OK, steps, but not necessarily window restrictors. So that the window restrictors on that basis goes beyond the conviction, which is the duty to take steps to the sentencing, basis upon which the sentence is made, which is the basis of plea recognising that in this case there should have been window restrictors. Does that make sense? Or, or not? <laughs> that, that may not have been helpful to the court. I didn't get a sense I was... Um, uh, 
I, I'm speaking against myself in this sense, but I'm mm. just in a sense that I would write, it would be easier for me to say this is all part of the conviction. The conviction of the, 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 the substance of the charge for which the guilty plea was made recognises a duty to take steps to guard against the risk. That's Shargo. But it doesn't go further and say these steps. It's only when we get to the basis of plea and whether the court sees the basis of plea as, as articulating the basis of conviction <laughs> or articulating the basis of sentence is what I'll leave to the court to resolve, if I may. It's part of the benefit of being an advocate and not a judge. But, but if, if and insofar as it's a part of the sentence and not the conviction, then it still bites. The, the principle of coherence and consistency still bites in my submission. And I then come to the findings of the judge. Is the failure to install window restrictors? And my, my lady, the judge did address the balancing exercise to which Lord Hoffman adverted in Tomlinson. Uh, and we see this largely in paragraph 63. I'm then going to jump my way around parts of paragraph 63. So this starts at page 68 of 88. So that was the reference to the guilty plea. And then we've got the B through to F section. And you can see that what the judge has done is on the one hand, and this is F2 and 3, recognise there is a foreseeable risk of serious injury, and if injury were to occur, it would inevitably be very serious, if not fatal. And against that, he's identified that there was no social value to the activity of opening the window sufficiently to fall out. That's 63D and 63F4. And there's no challenge, as my learned friend was at pains to say, against the findings on his side, so I'm afraid he can't have the benefit now of slipping in that he doesn't agree with the finding there's no social value at all. Uh, so that's social value. The cost of putting in the window restrictors for the window was between seven and eight pounds. That's paragraph 13. Uh, therefore, appropriately described, para 63 F5 as a minimal cost of preventative measures. Uh, and the judge himself at 63 E had put back into the mix the guilty plea to which I would add the basis of plea admitting that the risk assessment should have resulted in measures that would have addressed the risk and prevented the accident, uh, and to which he can and should have continued, namely the placing of window restrictors. Uh, so that is your classic balancing exercise, and the thrust of his judgment makes clear that he found appropriately there to be a breach. So there's a breach by reference to conviction stroke basis of plea and or findings of fact. The uh, defective sash mechanism constitutes a breach. We can come to its relevance, but I can't see how it being defective and described as being defective by the judge means it wasn't a breach. It's obviously the state of the premises. Uh, uh, and he's clear, paragraph 61, the sash mechanism was defective. Uh, the next issue is how the absence of window restrictors and the defective sash mechanism constituted a breach of duty vis-a-vis -vis the deceased. And this is where we need to go to the evidence rather than the conviction and basis of plea. We now leave the conviction and basis of plea behind because of their more general nature. And we're now looking at whether or not under the OLA we have not just what, what I would otherwise describe as a sort of putative breach, but a breach, putative breach converting to a real breach for this deceased. 
There was nothing in this case to distinguish this deceased from any other visitor. There's no finding to that effect. Uh, indeed, the findings are, are the other way around. Uh, and the position is akin to that in Lewis and Six Continents PLC. And I might just um, take you back to that, if I may. The whole um, analysis in that case uh, proceeded on the basis there was nothing special about the um, de deceased in that case, so that one simply had to look at visitors. Uh, so uh, that is para 19 on page 155 in the judgment of Lord Justice Ward. Where he says, but that's it. First, there was para 19, my lady. First, there was nothing exceptional about this visitor or the purpose for which he was using the room which modified the ordinary risks of occupation. There's no challenge to judges finding about the claimant status of sobriety, etc. Ultimately, the question is, as Mr. Braithwaite put it, was the window unsafe for anyone? And see uh, Lord Justice Sedley at Paris 24 to 25. judge also appropriately noted there's nothing wrong with this again that the criminal judge as part of his sentencing remarks had referred to every guest being placed at risk, that's the judgment of paragraph 47 At this stage of the inquiry, the learned judge recognised that the appellant had to take um, account the want of care, that's the section 2 brackets 3 of the OLA, to be all expected of a hotel guest, uh, which included, and we'll start, start if we may, at paragraph 63c, that's page 69, which included uh, second first party. You'll see he identifies this as, as, a, as a relevant part of his, his task in analysing the duty. And then the latter part of that, however, a significant number of hotel occupants in no smoking rooms, faced with no easily accessible outside access, e.g. on an upper floors, will try to smoke out of a window. In addition, a significant amount of hotel guests will consume alcohol, often supplied to the hotel, sometime in, in excess. These are facts of life for any hotelier. Uh, and it's also uh, foreseeable that the guests would try to open the window. That's para 63b. That was the passage that I think my lady, Lady Justice King, had asked for reference to earlier, that second part of that, so for all normal activities, as if opened, which is the very purpose of the sash window, etc. So this is a normal activity, i.e. wholly foreseeable activity, that if you put a sash window in someone's hotel room, and only that window, and not it's not one of these modern air-con um, environments, then uh, they may well want to open it. Not least, here is uh, court will recall, it was a very hot night. Uh, furthermore, the uh, guest may well want to do this at night, given that's the time when the room is most used. Uh, and at the risk of the obvious, at night, they are liable to be tired and see the finding, paragraph 41, page 63. Maybe that he sat for a while to cool down and closed his eyes. He must have been tired. It was late, 
He had not been sleeping well recently, and although not drunk, he had consumed a significant amount of alcohol. Those are all ordinary things to expect of your hotel visitors. And you will and should expect a degree of want of care in the way they then conduct themselves when tired, drunk to whatever degree, late at night in the heat. And then although uh, at one point today my learned friend uh, as part of uh, his bold submissions um, suggested that we were in a world of outside the scope the because this was, and he said, I do not shrink from it, or words to this effect, I do not shrink from it. This was not a foreseeable um, accident, or words to that effect. Nothing about this was foreseeable. And regrettably, from his perspective, the judge did not make that finding. Paragraph 103. Page 83. He made a finding to opposite effect. Secondly, broadly speaking, the conduct in question was, in my judgment, reasonably foreseeable. It was within the scope of the risk created by the defendants that a visitor may open the lower part of a window and lean out, particularly given the no smoking rule, etc. Could not be clearer. So, Viles disease. not bite in relation to this case. This is, this is all part of the defendant arguing there's a break in the chain of causation and the judge finding there was not a break in the chain of causation. And as part of his analysis, that what happened, that conduct, the conduct including the pull, that, that conduct was reasonably foreseeable and within the scope of risk. So that is, that is why, and it's by that combination of evidence, in our respectful submission, it becomes unarguable, subject to Section 2.5, that there was a breach of Section 2.2 to the deceased. And, and I didn't dare, my lady, to make that submission and assume it because of the uncertain nature of concessions being made in the variety uh, of approaches which have been adopted so that I've gone through um, to get to, to that it course of mission. Thank you. Well, lady, when, we, when we get to that course of mission, we then move on to my point four, which is how the breach of duty was a cause of the deceased's fall from the window. And here, my lady, our submission is that it's straightforward in the light of the submissions made above. More particularly, the deceased would not have been able to sit on the window sill and lean out if window restrictors had been in place. One, that's obvious. Two, as found by the judge at paragraph 48. Well, lady, that's why, no doubt, my learned friend took you to Power 48 and sought to draw a distinction vis-à-vis uh, -vis the finding of the judge uh, as to the step that was actually adopted and the, and, the, and the steps that could have been taken. But there's no space for that submission because I've gone through on breach. The breach is in relation to the failure to provide window restrictors. Very much to my learning junior's credit, he, he, he started with that and he stuck to that. The pleadings is not a failure to warn case. It is not a failure to warn case. It was a window restrictors case from the off. It's in the pleadings. He stayed with it. He pursued it to the end. He was right to do so. And once that finding has been causation is made.
The only uh, argument then left before we get to Section 2.5 is novice acts of intervenience, and that was run. <coughs> uh, after all, recognising that causation was otherwise made out, why else would you be running novice acts of intervenience? Uh, and it was rejected, and as you've seen, the learned friend did not obtain permission to appeal on that ground uh, from the learned judge below and didn't seek it from the Court of Appeal. Well, it was still put in quite short order. Uh, then I come to the uh, defective sash window, uh, which we've uh, referenced as in, in our respondent's notice, lest it not be essentially a part of what the judge has found. It's difficult to know in response to the question from my lady, lady Justice Lang, as to whether or not the judge kind of followed through on all of that. So we, we, we have our um, respondent's notice. Uh, and at 1F, page 28, we've set out our case as to what the judge did or should have done. 1F, page 28, my lady. And we set out the sash mechanism was defective, and I've taken you to paragraph 61 already, such that a visitor sitting on the windowsill would, as the judge found the deceased was, had to have been in an awkward position when leaning out, and you've seen that paragraph. I accept it's slightly, but not very, but it's still awkward, so I'll just stick to awkward. Awkward position when leaning out. And then, it's a, if you like, it's a submission at this point. Um, this is causally relevant to the deceased fall. But how could it not be, is how I would put it. How could it not be relevant that you're now put in an awkward position of having to hold up a sash window the same time as you're drawn to sitting on it and drawn to uh, leaning out. Well, being devil's advocate, what you might think, oh, that's really dodgy because it won't stay open. I'll um, I won't I won't sit on the window sill because it might fall down and hit me on the head. Well, my lady, one might one might think a number of things. This this is this is the pro problem when when it leads to someone dying and they're unable to give evidence might lead to a lot of things, lest, lest there be a risk of it being forgotten. This claim was reduced by 60% for contributory negligence. So if, if the force of the observation is to identify that there was fault on the part of the deceased, the judge has so found. And we, we take that under chin and have not sought to appeal it. And so we leave, leave that where it lies. Um, but as to whether <laughs> when it's defective, that's, that operates as some sort of a warning to avoid it. That's an ex that would be an extraordinary conclusion for the court to reach. Extraordinary. Uh, a, a defective sash mechanism is not an indicator that the windowsill is too low, such that your centre of gravity is too high above the windowsill and you're liable to fall out. <laughs> Warnings of themselves, section 2.4, are not necessarily enough. And that is not a warning of such. That is a defective sash which is just as liable to lead somebody, brackets, in the early hours of the morning, in the context of this case, etc., to want to prop it up, whether, whether as um, postulated by the court on their shoulder or howsoever. We don't know. We don't know how he sought to prop it up. But he must have sought to prop it up, because uh, else he wouldn't have been able to raise it and, and fall from the, from the window. So uh, there's an element of that cuts both ways, if I can respectfully put it that way, my lady. But it's all goes, it all goes to what becomes speculation, but it doesn't change the substance of the case at all. So, so that's causation. Uh, and then finally we come to uh, the issue of, of Valenti. And the starting point for the court, this is point five, either did not or should not have found that the cease was the Lentine known fit and jury. At the starting point is to address what the defendant must prove in order to avoid liability based upon a finding of the Lentine known fit and jury. And then the court can compare those requirements with the findings actually made by the judge at paragraph. My lady, I am going to have to go through Valentine Open Jury, not, not least when there is a, 
uh, sort of sideswipe that all the cases we've relied on don't really bite at all, um, just because this is a so classic um, danger, and, and now we're in a whole world that's separate from the world that we've set out. Well, it's a world that uh, isn't separate, uh, uh, and for these purposes, may I start with Clark and Linzel? So that's the supplementary appeal um, authorities. I know in fit injury at 3108. Can I invite the court to read the whole of 3108, please? couldn't be clearer that that is the appropriate test of Lenta. It's not split up and, and, and said that it's a test in certain circumstances but not in others. And we've given the whole of the chapter uh, in relation to Valenti and the court will see if the court chooses later to, to work through it. Um, the, the court, for instance, that, that Clark and Lindell, for instance, analyzes at page 436 an agreement after the defendant's breach of duty. Um, saying not for the first time, this is then on page 437, and um, the problem remains, if the claimant's acted unreasonably in taking a known risk, why is his conduct not merely contributory negligence? Uh, which is a recurring theme in the analysis, and, and so forth. So it may be that overnight, given this point has only risen today, I'll see if I can find further relevant parts of this in terms of the breakdown of um, types of cases, but there's no doubt that Valenti is Valenti. It, it, it's never, never knowingly been um, two separate defences with two separate sets of tests, um, to my knowledge, uh, uh, and that, that is my submission to the court. But I'll perhaps try to work through a bit of Clark and Linzel overnight if I may. What I then wish to do is to take the court through the three cases which we put before the court, as ever with this area, is a, and, and one knows that one risks. Um, the displeasure of the court, sometimes with too few and sometimes with too many authorities, but it's such an important, once we finally get to this point, this is the issue in the appeal, and um, once we've now, now reached it, we have to know what, what the issue is, and it isn't a plainly obvious issue, it's a valenti issue, uh, then we've given three authorities, and I would propose to go through them in, in their chronological order, if I may. So I'm going to start with Waldridge and Sumner. Uh, and page 410, Aldrin and Sumner is the um, spectator of a sports game uh, injured by uh, a sportsman and his horse, I think. And what has what the spectator consented to by turning up? Uh, and the, the short answer is that the position is much like um, Lady Justice Hale, as she then was, said in a case called King and Sussex in relation to, say, a, a fireman or an ambulance person, you consent to the ordinary risks associated with the activity, but you don't consent to carelessness. So if you're in the army, if you're in the, in the fire services, emergency services, you consent to the inevitable risks that come, and there are risks if you spectate, you can imagine, um, any fan of cricket in a cricket ground, and this isn't just Bolton and Stone, but you actually see it in a cricket ground, there's so much drinking that goes on these days that some of them are going to get hit by all the slogging in the matches. Well, they consented to that. 
um, because that's, that's the game they're watching, but they wouldn't, for instance, consent to a bat being thrown, as an example sometimes given, or a tennis racket being thrown into, into Wimbledon's um, audience in the front row. Um, that, that's the sort of essence of it. But if we go to the passage that we've highlighted in the judgment of Lord Justice Diplock, uh, and can I pick it up where he says, the maxim in English law presupposes a tortious act by the defendant. And I'm going to emphasize that because I'm going to come back to it when um, no more than is strictly necessary, I venture to um, criticize the analysis of Mr. Justice Colson in the Geary case. Because as we see here, it's, it's, it presupposes a very nice use of language, the tortious act by the defendant, and that is entirely consistent um, see the observations from Lady, Lady Justice Nicola Davies uh, with the stepwise approach of the Section 2 of the Occupies of Liberty. Uh, the consent that is relevant is not consent to the risk of injury, but consent to the lack of reasonable care that may produce that risk and requires on the part of the plaintiff at the time at which he gives his consent full knowledge of the nature and extent of the risk that he ran. And just reading that concise and accurate summation of Valenti makes clear why the authors of Clark and Lindsell and Buckley, which we've also included, um, suggest that it's uh, not of employed, and properly so, and the proper territory is normally that of contributory negligence. Because that is going some to establish Valente, if I can use that colloquialism. It's high. It's, it's high, high, my lady. I mean, whether one then says very high for her emphasis, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's, it's a really high mm -hmm. requirement because it goes back to the Lord Denning, and we're going to come to the nettleship, it's not sienti known mm -hmm. fit in jury. It's not enough to know. Full knowledge of the risk is not enough. Full knowledge. You have to consent to the breach of duty. And we'll see some more of the language which is employed uh, when we then perhaps now come to Nettleship and Western. So I've given you what that's about. Um, page 373 in the judgment of uh, Lord Denning. Again, he too could not be clearer between F and G in the highlighted passage or sidebar passage, either in former times the defence was used in alternative defence to contributory negligence, either the defence defeated the action. Now that contributory negligence was not a complete defence, but only for ground for reducing damages, the defence of Valente known fit in jury has been closely considered, and in consequence, it has been severely limited. Knowledge of the risk of injury is not enough nor is a willingness to take the risk of injury. Nothing will suffice short of an agreement to waive any claim for negligence. The plaintiff must agree expressly or impliedly to waive any claim for any injury that may befall him due to the lack of reasonable care by the defendant. That is wholly of a piece with the judgment of Lord Justice Diplock. Clark and Lindsay pour over the issue of agreement, and this is all in the section that we've provided the court with, and, and that's why Lord Denning says, or impliedly, because it won't be frequently that there'll be a <laughs> document with some form of waiver, uh, and also we're in a um, post-ACTA uh, world of uh, contract terms. Um, but uh, that's the requirement. Morris and Murray is a very interesting case. Uh, Morris and Murray is, uh, starts at page 318. This is, this is, my own friend said, the paradigm would be taking a lift in someone's car. Well, this was taking a lift in his aircraft. Uh, uh, and so one can begin to sense the hazard that the plaintiff was choosing to expose himself to. And so it is a paradigm for Valenti 
but also gives a sense of the extreme nature of facts that, that satisfy the defence. Uh, this uh, judgment, uh, well, two judgments to go to. First of all, Lord Justice Fox, starting at page 327. At the top, he's fighting the difference between CNs and volens at B. Uh, in C, uh, backing up, there's a host of case law, as you can imagine, but a lot of it very old from the nation to the Lenten. Uh, in the middle, he says, on the other hand, if it's evident to the passenger from the first that the driver is so drunk that he is incapable of driving safely, the passenger must have accepted the obvious risk of injury. And I'll come back to that when, when going to the facts of this case, which I'm going to hold back, and certainly given the time, I'll hold back, and if I may, until tomorrow. But gives you a sense of, of the risk that's appreciated is the risk of carelessness. We've seen that. And, so, and it comes out very nicely in that passage there. Has the passenger from the off seen that the driver is so drunk that he's incapable of driving safely? So he's bound to be careless. It's that obvious to you that he's bound to be careless. Then there's reference to Lord Pierce, this is an E and F, in ICI and Shatwell. That was the case in which two employees chose to play with dynamite um, in fla flagrant disregard to their employer's orders with the consequences which become inevitable for those with practicing in personal injury, or we'd never, never see the cases. Um, and there is concerns common law employment. The defense of Valentine loan fit in jury is clearly applicable if there was a genuine full agreement, free from any pressure, to assume the risk of loss. That's showing that it's a risk of carelessness going to the loss. Uh, uh, down at the bottom at H is a 1956 case called Slater, which is a little bit like the King and Sussex approach from Lady Justice Hale. It's, it's yes, you'll assume some risks, but not the risk of carelessness by the defendant. So if I go down a tunnel, I might just, and, a, and a train comes through when it was expected to, that's my fault. It's obvious that trains are going to come through tunnels, but if the train driver has acted negligently, then, then it's not relented in that case. And then over the page 328 between B and C, here we have an identification of the facts, the core facts of this case. The danger was both obvious and great, and, that, and I, to which I would add, the danger created by the defendant's drinking, because that's it's his drinking that rendered him incapable of flying an aircraft safely. He couldn't possibly have supposed that Mr. Murray, who had been drinking all afternoon, was capable of discharging a normal duty of care. So it's front and centre for the plaintiff. And then over, over the page, here was a case at B, uh, complying with an example given by Mr Justice Asquith, the drunkenness of the driver at the mature time is so extreme and so glaring that to accept a lift from him is in an intrinsically and obviously dangerous occupation. I think that is that in embarking upon the flight the plaintiff had, in the same language as received from Lord Denning, implicitly waived his rights in the event of injury consequent upon Mr Murray's failure to fly with reasonable care. So those were the rights he was waiving. You are, if you like, forgiving the defendant. That's what you're doing. You're forgiving them for their breach of duty. And much shorter from Lord Justice Stocker for our purposes. Over the page again, please, to page 330. The sidebar passage, that paragraph. Can I invite the court, please, to read that? And as, as one would expect, there is absolute consistency in the Court of Appeal over time. 
in these cases in their describing the essential stepping stones of the defence of Valentai. And unsurprising, when um, one then goes back to 3108 in Clark and Dinsel at page 433, why learned authors of Clark and Dinsel have set it out in the way they have. It's a different, different language, but it's very clear. Agreement by the claims of resolved defendant from legal responsibility for his conduct. Lady, is that a convenient moment? If that is convenient for you, it is convenient for us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very well, 10.30 to 1 then. Yeah. 